Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. And we're starting at one sharp, so if folks log on a little late, that's too bad. But we've got a lot to talk about. So my name is Brandon Butler. Uh, I am the Director of Public Policy Initiatives here at the Association of Research Libraries. And uh, I've, we're, we have the pleasure of uh, uh, three really wonderful experts who are going to speak with us today a little bit about this Kurtzang v. Wiley case, which is pending in the Supreme Court. So first, let me tell you a little bit about the folks that are going to be joining us. Our first speaker today is Kevin Smith. Uh, as Duke's, Duke University's first director of copyright and scholarly communications, Kevin's principal role is to teach and advise faculty, administrators, and students about copyright, intellectual property licensing, and scholarly publishing. Kevin's a librarian and an attorney, double, double threat. He's admitted to the bar in Ohio and North Carolina and holds a graduate degree in religion from Yale University. And my, my degree is in philosophy, so we'll do a debate at a different webcast. Um, at Duke, Kevin serves on the university's uh, Intellectual Property Board and Digital Futures Task Force, and he convenes the Open Access Advisory Panel. He's currently the chair of the ACRL's Research and Scholarly Environment Committee and serves on the SPARC Steering Committee. His highly regarded by me and many uh, weblog on scholarly communications, which you can find at, uh, uh, by Googling scholarly communications, uh, Duke, discusses copyright and publications in academia, and he is a frequent speaker on those topics. Um, so Kevin's our first speaker. Our second speaker is Jonathan Band. Uh, Jonathan helps shape the laws governing intellectual property and the Internet through a combination of legislative and appellate advocacy. Jonathan represents clients with respect to the drafting of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, the Pro-IP Act, and other federal and state statutes relating to intellectual property and the Internet. He complements this legislative advocacy by filing amicus briefs in significant cases related to these provisions uh, and many others. Uh, Mr. Band is an adjunct professor at the Georgetown University Law Center and has written extensively on intellectual property and the Internet, including books Interfaces on Trial and Interfaces on Trial 2.0 and over 100 articles. The man is busy. Uh, Mr. Band uh, went to Harvard for undergrad and Yale Law School for, law, uh, for his J.D., uh, he was a partner at Morrison and Forrester, affectionately known as MoFo here in D.C., uh, and now he is a solo practitioner who is, most importantly, of counsel to the Library Copyright Alliance and the primary author of LCA's amicus brief in the Kurtzang case. And finally, uh, a librarian's librarian and a copyright expert's copyright expert, Carrie Russell, uh, is the director of the Program on Public Access to Information at the ALA's Office for Information Technology Policy. Since 1999, Kerry has developed copyright education programs and related services to help ALA members understand the latest trends regarding copyright law and its impact on libraries writ large. Kerry has given presentations and workshops on copyright all over the country at numerous conferences and is the author of several articles and two fantastic books on copyright and libraries. Uh, before joining the ALA Washington office staff, Kerry was a librarian at the University of Arizona. Uh, while she was there uh, for 14 years, she ran the gamut of librarian uh, gigs uh, from serials cataloger to undergraduate services librarian. As the university's copyright librarian, Carrie consulted with faculty regarding curriculum, uh, curriculum-related copyright issues, and she informed the campus community about pending copyright legislation and developed an advocacy program for faculty about scholarly communication and alternative publishing models, you know, open access, right? Um, Carrie played an instrumental role in her library's strategic planning, organizational development, and self-assessment. Uh, Carrie earned her master's in library and information science from University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, a master of arts in media arts from University of Arizona, so she can judge the debate between me and Kevin. And Carrie was the recipient of the 2001 ALA Staff Achievement Award, writes a monthly copyright column for School Library Journal, and, as I mentioned, is the author of two really delightful books about copyright. Uh, so those are our distinguished speakers, and uh, now let me give you a little bit of an idea of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, first, I'm going to go through some basic background facts before anybody else uh, gets into the legal stuff. Uh, then you're going to hear a little bit about this problem in general of the first sale right, whatever that is, and gray markets, these uh, importation issues. Uh, and then you'll hear a little bit about the Kurtzang case and uh, the brief that the Library Copyright Alliance filed in that case and some of the other briefs in the case. And then finally, you'll hear from Carrie about the stakes for public libraries and schools and some of the broader constituencies out there beyond the research library world. And then, last but not least, we will all put our reputations on the line and make some predictions. Uh, so first,
first, let me kind of give you some very, very basic background facts, which I will not spend much time on, because if you're here, you probably know them. Uh, the first is, this is not the first case on this issue, right? Uh, the first case uh, to reach the Supreme Court on this question of first sale was called Costco v. Omega. That case dealt with luxury watches, which just happened to have a copyright logo inscribed on the back of them. Um, and in that case, nothing happened uh, at the Supreme Court because they were deadlocked. Uh, the very important Justice Kagan, Alina Kagan, who had only just recently been appointed to the court, had participated below, and so she recused herself, and the rest of them deadlocked at 4-4. So there is no Supreme Court law on this issue. Kurt Sang is the first. Uh, the facts in the Kurt Sang case are pretty interesting. Uh, Mr. Kurt Sang is a Thai national who is here in the U.S. Uh, going to school, and his uh, family in Thailand would buy foreign textbooks printed and sold there fairly cheaply and then sell, uh, ship them to Mr. Kurt Sang, who would then turn around and sell them in the U.S. in competition with the domestic. These are not pirate copies. They were printed with the authorization of Wiley, but they were printed in Thailand and sold uh, for a Thai audience. They were bought lawfully abroad, right? His family didn't steal them. They just went to the market and bought them like you do, but they were sold here in the U.S., and that is why uh, we are here today, this very strange um, confluence of facts. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin to tell us why is all this stuff a problem, what's going on in the law? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. And I'm looking forward to that debate. I also have an undergraduate degree in philosophy, so we'll be, we'll be uh, well, I'm not so sure well matched. But anyway, um, so what's the problem? I'm just going to take a few minutes to look at the legal structures, and in this case, it's the interrelation between different parts of the copyright law that have created the problem that the Supreme Court has to deal with in Kurtzog. The first the most basic thing to remember is that copyright is a bundle of exclusive rights, and one of those exclusive rights is the right to distribute the copyrighted work. Um, that's the right that Mr. Kertzog is accused of having infringed. Um, and the language is very simple. The owner of the copyright has the exclusive right to do or to authorize the distribution of copies of the copyrighted work to the public by sale or other transfer of ownership or by rental, lease, or lending. And of course, lending, which is part of the distribution right, is the real issue for libraries. It's not for Mr. Kirtzog because he was accused of resale, but it's the real issue for libraries. As all librarians know, the, uh, all of the rights in the Copyright Act are subject to exceptions, and one of the most important is the limitation on the exclusive right to distribute that's called first sale. Um, the first sale right is, or the first sale doctrine, is an exception to that exclusive right to distribute a copyrighted work. And what the first sale doctrine says is that the owner of a particular copy of a work that is lawfully made under this title, and that language is very important, may sell, lend, or rent that copy without permission, um, and that's what libraries in the United States are founded on. Um, and it also says that we may that we the purchaser the person who owns a lawfully made copy may display the copy to persons present at the place where that copy is located and by the way that's extremely important for museums and raises an issue uh, that if the Second Circuit's opinion in Kurtzog is upheld there could be problems for museums as well as libraries as well as lots and lots of other people so this doctrine of first sale is what allows us to lend lawfully made copies of a work that we purchase for our libraries. It's what allows students to resell their textbooks after their classes are finished. It's what allows us to resell, lend, loan, all kinds of material, anything that is subject to copyright. Another way that we refer to this to emphasize that it is um, an exception to the distribution right is we often say that the right of distribution and the right of public display, those exclusive rights are exhausted after the first sale of a particular copy. Um, so sometimes this is referred to in international law, this is referred to as the doctrine of exhaustion. Uh, but all that means is that the distribution and public display rights, which exclusively belong to the copyright holder, are exhausted 
once there's been a lawful sale of the work. That particular work is then subject to all the rights in the first sale doctrine. So now the question is, when does this exception, the first sale doctrine, actually apply? Specifically, the question is, what does it mean to say that a work is lawfully made under this title? This title refers to Title 17 of the United States Code, which is the copyright law of the United States. So what does that mean, to say it's lawfully made under this title? There are several different answers, and the courts have not been consistent in this. One possibility is that it means manufactured in the United States, actually made on U.S. soil. Another possibility would be that it means manufactured abroad but sold in the United States. Um, there have been a number of different cases. There is a case called Quality King that involved mattresses in which the Supreme Court upheld a first sale, the doctrine of first sale, when the goods had been manufactured in the U.S., sold to a foreign distributor, and then re-imported, the so-called round trip. Um, in that case, the Supreme Court clearly said, hey, they were manufactured in the U.S., they were made right here, they're subject to Title 17, and therefore they're lawfully made under this title um, for the purpose of first sale. A later case uh, that was not a Supreme Court case, but a Ninth Circuit case called Drug Emporium held that when foreign goods, goods manufactured outside of the United States, are sold in the U.S. with the authorization of the rights holder, first sale would still apply. Um, so something can be manufactured outside the U.S. but sold with the authorization of the rights holder in the U.S. and still be subject to first sale. That's not the case in Kertzog. Remember, Brandon just told you, the textbooks were manufactured outside of the United States, and they were sold in the U.S. without the authorization of the rights holder because Mr. Kurtzeg believed they were subject to first sale and that he was allowed to do that. But um, that case gets us part way, and I think Brandon's, or I'm sorry, John is going to tell you more about that, but it doesn't get us to where we need to be. Um, instead, in Kurtzeg, the Second Circus Circuit, circus, there's a Freudian slip. The Second Circuit focused entirely on the place of manufacture and said that if it was made outside the United States, there was no first sale. So this is what we're debating. When does the exception apply to what kinds of goods? Do they have to be manufactured in the United States? Can they make a round trip? Supreme Court has tell, told us they could. What if the sales authorized in the U.S. even though the goods were made elsewhere? What if the goods were made and sold elsewhere? Those are the different scenarios we're looking at. And in the Kyrgyzstan case, the Second Circuit pretty clearly said they had to be made in the U.S. to be subject to first sale. And part of the reason for that is this other clause in the Copyright Act, which is called the Importation Clause. Um, it's a kind of a strange provision. It was put into our law uh, before we had agreed to international treaties that extended copyright protection to uh, works that were created by nationals of other countries in other countries. Um, the Importation Clause is separate from first sale, but it is very much related. Um, and basically it says that U.S. copyright law applies only to works, well, no, I'm sorry, it used to say that U.S. copyright law applied only to works that were manufactured in the United States. That was the first part of the importation clause, and it was repealed when we joined the international treaties. But Section 602, the second part of the importation clause, still forbids importation without the authorization of the copyright holder of goods that are acquired outside the United States. That's the fundamental reason why the Second Circuit decided that first sale applied only to works manufactured in the United States. Because of this provision, they decided that works that were manufactured elsewhere were not lawfully made under this title and therefore not subject to the first sale exception. Now, this provision that forbids importation of goods acquired outside the United States does have some exceptions. 
One of those exceptions is for single copies purchased by somebody who's traveling and brought back for their personal use. You go, like I did, went to study in London and brought back uh, boxes full of books. Um, that's okay. I'm not violating the importation clause by bringing back those single copies. There's also an exception that says that library books are okay, up to five copies that are purchased abroad for the purpose of lending or archiving. So libraries have this limited exception to the importation clause uh, for books that they buy abroad. That may not be enough, and I think John is going to tell you about the risks there, but it's there. Let's note that for now. There's also an exception for audiovisual material that's bought for library purposes. It refers to only a single copy, and interestingly, it says for archiving purposes, we may import a single copy of an audiovisual work for archiving purposes, but unlike the exception for books, it doesn't actually mention lending. So you see when we look at this clause, you can see where the Second Circuit was coming from, but you can also see why what they've said has the potential to cause significant problems. Um, so basically the, the Second Circuit looked at this clause and said, this tells us that only things that are manufactured in the United States are subject to the doctrine of first sale. So obviously the stakes for libraries are pretty high here, and we're going to talk more about those in a minute. Um, we acquire lots of materials that are manufactured abroad, including lots of films. That's what I, what I quoting, um, who am I quoting here, I, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, call the known unknowns. We know that we have lots of things that we bought abroad. And right now, we don't know whether or not the doctrine of first sale applies to that. So those items are the known unknowns. But we also, we also know that U.S. publishers actually have a lot of their books printed overseas. So they're technically manufactured abroad, but we may have no way to know that. So that's the unknown unknown for us. And the question is, can we lend these items? Obviously, a decision in this case has tremendous stakes for libraries, the potential to wreak havoc in our libraries, and not just in libraries. Uh, potentially, this case could cause problems for anyone who resells or buys secondhand material that contains copyrightable components. Um, obviously, the case arose from a student reselling textbooks. If what Mr. Kirtzag did was illegal, then what our students do routinely selling their, um, their secondhand textbooks may also be illegal. I also find myself wondering if I will be able to resell my Toyota, which has copyrighted software in it. Um, so the way this case comes out could affect a huge swath of so-called gray markets or secondhand markets. Um, so it's a very, very important case to watch. And uh, with that, I'll turn over to John. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, so just to, to quickly recap, so the, 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 the specific case involves uh, this, uh, this graduate student, uh, Kirtzang. And as uh, Kevin and Brandon mentioned, the Court of Appeals found that this phrase lawfully made under this title means uh, manufactured in the United States. And so, and so it said that, that the first sale doctrine did not apply to these copies that were lawfully printed abroad. Um, the, uh, the Second Circuit uh, issued this decision last year. Uh, it was appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court agreed to hear the appeal. In others, it granted uh, the petition for certiorari. Uh, the oral argument is scheduled for later this month, October 29th, and that's why we're holding this webcast now uh, in, an, uh, in anticipation of the oral argument. And then we expect a decision uh, sometime before the before June 2013. That's when the the current uh, Supreme Court term ends. So we expect that the decision will be issued uh, sometime before then. I mean, it could it could it could you know come out much sooner than June. It could come out in uh, December or January, uh, but 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 uh, no later uh, no later than June. So there's a lot of briefing 
uh, the, the, a lot of briefs have been submitted in this case, and so uh, the, the, the main the, you know, the parties' briefs are all focused about this, uh, you know, the, the, the lawfulness of selling this textbook. But we filed a brief uh, as well. And what our argument was, you know, we, we were talking about what our preferred outcome is, is that, is that, uh, is that uh, Kirtseng wins. In other words, that the term, uh, the, the phrase lawfully made under this title would apply to uh, lawfully made anywhere. In other words, lawfully made in compliance with the copyright laws, so, so in other words, non piratical copies. So that would be the broadest interpretation of uh, the uh, of this phrase lawfully made under this title, and that would be of you know greatest benefit to libraries. But at the same time, <clears throat> you know we, we we anticipated that that might not work, and so we were sort of coming up with various fallback positions. Um, and so one fallback position was what. Uh, uh, Kevin mentioned, uh, which is this, uh, you know, an our, uh, a theory that the Ninth Circuit first articulated, uh, lawfully made overseas but imported with the authorization of the rights holder. So that would take care of libraries uh, with respect to copies that they buy here in the United States from an authorized dealer. So that would that would be obviously helpful. Um, and now it still, still wouldn't take us all the way where we want to go because we still buy a lot of copies overseas uh, from from uh, uh, from publishers and distributors and so forth overseas. And so we need to have a variety of other theories. Uh, and I'll go over some of those in a minute. Um, but a lot of what the brief is trying to do is trying to say, you know, okay, our preference is to have this broad interpretation of lawfully made of, uh, under this title. But in the alternative, uh, you know, what are these other theories and, and how do we make sure that they're as broad as and strong as they can be? And in particular, how do we, you know, how do we get uh, get people to get the justices perhaps to affirm that these other theories have some validity, and that was to some extent the strategy behind our amicus brief. Now, fortunately, uh, and again, in our brief, a lot of it was, you know, besides legal argument, a lot of it was, you know, talking about the 400-year history of library lending in the United States and this parade of horribles that if we can't lend library, you know, do, do, you know, if the first sale doctrine is eliminated, then there's this, uh, with respect to a lot of these copies, then, then there are these uh, possible ramifications. And so, therefore, you need to give us some help, uh, either, uh, either again, agree with Kurt Singh's argument or come up with some other theory that t helps take care of libraries. And uh, much to our... Uh, uh, I guess surprise and uh, edification. Um, both Wiley, who's the uh, the appellee here, the the respondent, the publisher, uh, as well as the U.S. government, in various various uh, arguments they've made, have uh, have, have in essence uh, uh, agreed that uh, the, the the court should interpret this case or should apply this case in a way that minimizes harm to libraries. And so, let me just quickly run through a couple of the things they've said, uh, which which are very beneficial to us. So, so in particular, uh, you know, Wiley said uh, had two arguments as to why. A library wouldn't have to worry uh, about uh, uh, copies that are, you know, especially with copies that they bought in the United States, even if it's foreign made. Why they wouldn't have to worry about copies made in the United States first? They they said, well, you know, there is this Ninth Circuit theory uh, that um, uh, that it doesn't apply to uh, that the first sale doctrine. Uh, applies to copies sold with authorization, and they also said uh, implied license, uh, so that if a, if a, someone is selling it to a library, there's sort of an implied license that the library can uh, can lend it. Uh, in other words, why would someone sell something to a library if they didn't expect the library to lend it? 
The Solicitor General uh, of the United States, in its brief, uh, had a had a specific footnote that 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 again affirmed the various theories, and I'll go over some of those a bit more in a minute. Uh, of, uh, and agreed that all these different theories, these alternative theories to the first sale doctrine, should be interpreted in a broad manner, helpful to libraries. Uh, but they also had a very interesting theory as to why um, the 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 why the first sale doctrine applies to copies uh, made in the made overseas but sold with authorization in the United States. They said it's not a matter of how you interpret Section 109A, which is the first sale doctrine. Uh, as codified that, that, that Kevin was talking about before, and you don't need to worry about this phrase lawfully made under this title. The, the, the Solicitor General said, you know, there is this inherent sort of common law of first sale that under, that, that is even broader than the statute. Uh, and, and that, that, you know, so it's sort of saying, even if you never had, even if Congress never enacted Section 109A, uh, there is an exhaustion doctrine. There is a first sale doctrine, and if something is sold uh, with, uh, you know, something is sold without the authorization of the rights holder, then the uh, the copyright uh, uh, expires. Uh, the distribution right expires. Exa- is exhausted with respect to that copy, uh, and so that's how they sort of reached. They said you don't even need to worry about this lawfully made under this title thing because uh, you do have this common law limitation on the uh, copyright uh, on the distribution right. So that's that's a pretty far-reaching theory uh, that the Solicitor General articulated of this sort of common law of. Uh, the common law notion of uh, of the first sale doctrine, uh, and and uh, you know I, I just to leap ahead a bit to the prediction phase. I have a feeling that that's something we'll be hearing more about for the Supreme Court. So in any event, where does all that leave us? So if you look at this chart, uh, you can see that that uh, again our preferred outcome would be just to say lawfully made under this title means non paratical and then we don't need to worry about where it's made. But assuming that you do uh, end up with something else, um, uh, you, you know, we, we you have first this notion, uh, so again, if it's lawfully made, if it's made in the United States, you obviously, you know, the first sale doctrine applies. So then that's the top line. So then you get to the next category, manufactured outside the United States, uh, and then the top there, you know, when it splits, and then the top line again is authorized. Uh, uh, you know, it's uh, the authorized uh, 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 U.S. sale of the copy. And if the authorized, if it's sale with the, with the authorization, then one theory would be again this Ninth Circuit theory, or another one would be uh, uh, the, the Solicitor General's theory. Um, and then, but what happens if it's not sold with authorization in the United States? In other words, you still buy it overseas. And this, again, is an area where we had some concern. So Kevin mentioned you have these five, uh, there is this exception to Section 602 that allows for a library to import five copies for the purpose of lending, uh, of, of, of archiving and library lending. But the problem with that phrase, you could say, oh, that's pretty good. I mean, that means a library, at least, you know, if it buys five copies uh, of a book, then it can do whatever it wants with them. Well, not so fast. First of all, um, uh, sometimes if it's a big library system, it might buy more than five copies of the book. But even if it is buying five or fewer copies, you still have a problem because the way the statute is worded is it says you have an exception from the importation right. So that means you're allowed to import it for the purpose of library lending. But it doesn't actually say you can lend it. Now, you can say, well, that, of course, is implied, but it still doesn't say that you can lend it. And so you might have an exception for the importation right for the purpose uh, you know, under this provision under 602A, but you don't necessarily have the, an exception from the distribution right. And and so that was one of the things where, where the library said, well, of course, it would be, you know, in our brief, we said it would be ridiculous if it did not, if it was not implicit that you could import it and lend it. 
but uh, it would be nice if the court said so. And and uh, the, this is where the Solicitor General, in a footnote, said, yeah, we agree with the libraries that 602 allows the library not only to import it, it's to import those five copies, but also to lend those five copies. So having the Solicitor General validate that, is that, that position is, is very, very helpful if there's ever any future litigation, but, and also could even prevent future litigation, meaning people are going to realize publishers aren't going to bother going there because they know that we'll be able to point to the Solicitor General brief. But what would even be better, of course, is if the Supreme Court somewhere picks up that notion that, that 602 allows us not only to import those five copies, but actually to lend five copies. And then finally, you know, we do have this, even even assuming that, that, that 602 allows us to uh, import the five copy and lend five copies of books, we still have that, that the other prong that Kevin mentioned, which is the uh, uh, audiovisual materials, and there you're only allowed to import the one copy, but it's only for preservation purposes. So if you were importing uh, a DVD of a you know a foreign film, but then you wanted to lend it, uh, you, you know. The, 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 you, you, it would hard, be hard to make that this argument that this provision even allows you to lend it. So at that point, you'd need to rely on fair use. Uh, and, and, of course, to some extent, you could say all of this relies uh, on fair use uh, or on implied license, uh, but, but certainly fair use. And so uh, that is, uh, again, an argument that uh, the Solicitor General uh, pointed to not again not only implied license but also fair use in essence saying that in its opinion uh if a library engages in lending that is a fair use and so that having simply you know even that one uh uh, sentence uh, in this footnote in the Solicitor General's brief, sort of uh, again very helpful, and, and to some extent, uh, you know, we we achieved one of our limited objectives uh, in the brief, which is to get sort of a validation uh, uh, from you know the Solicitor General, and then again, hopefully from the court that that uh, the various these alternative theories are useful and helpful. Uh, in if if for some reason uh, the first sale doctrine itself is is found not to apply to these uh, copies made uh, overseas, and with that I will turn things over to Kerry. Thanks very much, Jonathan. I'm going to dig a little bit deeper about why libraries care about this issue, and of course it goes back to your professional values as a librarian. Um, the first sale doctrine advances the purpose of the copyright law, and we know the copyright law, is its purpose is to advance learning through the distribution of you know, creative works, information, knowledge. So first sale is very important in getting um, items out, distributing them. Um, kind of often think about this as the free flow of information, how easy it is to borrow a book from a friend, or how easy it is to get a, a, a book from the library, check it out, maybe you want to buy it. Um, the other reason why we care is that only libraries offer no fee access through library lending, and there still are many people that um, are left behind if we don't offer this type of, uh, of free service. Um, so the digital divide and digital literacy are always going to be part of this um, equation. And we believe that the nation also benefits from library lending. Um, we are democracy. We believe that people should be informed citizens so they can participate in the democracy. And the other thing I think people don't think about all the time is maybe they think that we just buy a lot of copies of Shades of shades of gray, when really we buy a, a diverse material um, in the marketplace that you might not find in um, the bookstore for purchase. The second reason is reading. We love reading. Um, library lending advances reading, and reading is the foundation of all learning. President Obama said that. It promotes literacy, creativity, and innovation. And the important role that libraries play here, in addition, is that we ensure that readers can remain anonymous. Unlike um, any kind of purchase 
kinds of activities that you might engage in for content. It's not necessarily known whether you um, you remain anonymous uh, or that they can track whether um, what types of books that you are reading. And what's at stake for public schools and libraries? Um, it would be, you know, limit our, our ability to acquire and lend many, many, many things. When we know that up to 90% of the titles that we purchase here in the United States are manufactured overseas, you can see that this would really put a damper on what we could acquire and lend. The worst case scenario is that libraries would have to ensure that books they lend are manufactured in the United States. And that would be difficult to do because these books that we have today aren't necessarily including where they are printed. Um, so how would you know if you had a title that was produced in a foreign state? Another thing that I've always kind of been afraid of is that um, the court will get into the kinds of lending that other countries do where exhaustion applies, but they have to pay a lending fee um, in order to lend books. And I can see that publishers would be quite happy to see libraries uh, paying a license fee to lend books. And that would usually be like some part of your acquisitions budget. Um, and then the other thing is that it could spark interest in digital first sale. Um, and that could lead to some undesirable information policy where, again, the rights holders might win big and we would find ourselves um, strapped for getting content pushing the content more into the marketplace rather than at the free institution of libraries. And now I'll turn it back to Brandon. All right. Thanks a lot, Carrie. So we just kind of heard the worst case scenario from Carrie, which um, she has a better imagination than I do because she foresaw some things <laughs> I didn't even think about. Um, uh, so things could go uh, really quite bad. Um, but I wonder if we could think about what a best case scenario would look like. And I think I want to look to Kevin um, to guess, you know, how could, could the court get this absolutely right and solve this problem for everybody? Is that as good as it could get? Or could it get that good at all? Well, without without saying anything about what I think the likelihood of it is, uh, I think Jonathan has already told us what the best case scenario would be, and that would be for the court to define lawfully made under this title as applying to anything that was lawfully made with the authority of the rights holder, regardless of where it was made or where it was sold, as long as it's not pirated, as long as it's not a DVD that's been pressed in somebody's or burned in somebody's basement uh, to be sold on a blanket. Um, it should be subject to first sale because it would have been lawfully made under this title, lawfully simply meaning made with the authority of the rights holder. Um, and I think there's an argument for that. I, I hinted at that a little bit, but I, I want to say it explicitly. The importation clause that's being used here to define lawfully made under this title was part of our copyright law before we recognized most copyrights in foreign works long before we joined the Berne Convention in 1988, which is when we did begin to recognize all kinds of international copyright. So the importation clause is really a hangover from a time when copyright law was used as a kind of protectionist tool. Um, and I think we need to recognize, I think the court needs to recognize, that now we are in a situation where we extend the rights under copyright very, very broadly. Any signatory nation of the Berne Convention gets national treatment in the United States. In other words, they're subject to exactly the same rights that American authors are. And I would like to see the court recognize that in this changed situation, it is not only the case that we should extend the copyrights, the rights under copyright, the limit, the exclusive rights to international works, but also make those works subject to the same exceptions. If the court follows the Second Circuit, then basically works that are manufactured abroad would be in a better stance than works that are made in the United States. And that would be a very bizarre outcome. So I would hope the court would look to our international agreements and say those international agreements really push us towards 
ruling that lawfully made under this title applies to any work that can claim U.S. copyright protection. That is, any work that was manufactured with the authority of the rights holder. So that's the best case scenario, and that's one of the ways I think the court could get to it. Thanks, Kevin. And it's funny, that is that, that would be a really deep irony because, as you described, right, the U.S. Copyright Act initially was a kind of protectionist regime that gave a special, that only gave protection to folks who would have their works manufactured in the U.S. And it sounds like uh, the Second Circuit certainly acknowledged that their ruling would reverse that entirely. That is, it's an incentive to put your factories overseas, because if you do, uh, you can control resale and lending and all that good stuff. So it would be a really perverse outcome. And that's a really good point to note that the, the Second Circuit, in rendering their decision, actually noted that that was happening. They knew there was a bad outcome here, uh, and they still felt uh, bound to do this, and hopefully the Supreme Court can uh, can reverse that. That's right. Okay, and then, Jonathan, I wonder if you, since you've been reading all of these briefs and uh, and following this really closely, I wonder... Uh, how would you handicap things? What do you think is most likely to happen, given all of the information that's in front of the court? Well, before uh, the briefing started, my what I would have said is, uh, you know, I, I thought that there was a, the likelihood of affirmance of the Second Circuit was very high, that they would simply sort of come out with a very simple affirmance saying lawfully made under this title means lawfully made under the in the United States, and yes, it has all those perverse outcomes that Kevin was alluding to, but that's Congress's problem. And, you know, uh, this has been the rule for, you know, umpty um beers, and we haven't seen, uh, you know, a lot of companies moving overseas just for this reason. They're moving overseas for all kinds of reasons. And so, uh, you know, and we haven't seen publishers really clamping down on uh, the secondary market. So, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the concerns that people are raising are sort of exaggerations, but in any event, that's Congress's problem, not ours. So that's where I, you know, I'd say six weeks ago or a month ago, that's where I thought the case was headed. And then, uh, much to my surprise, and, and again, much uh, you know, to my pleasant surprise, I saw first the Wiley brief where they, in essence, um, agreed to this Ninth Circuit compromise view that. Uh, 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 that the first sale doctrine can apply to copies made overseas but sold with the authorization of the rights holder. Um, you know, I was surprised that they did that, and I think to some extent they did that because, you know, in response to the argument we made in favor of that position in our brief, and they specifically cited our brief and the, you know, the, the justification we came up with for that. Um, but I was still surprised that they did that. But then, uh, all the more so when the, the the solicitor general, you know, came to that same result uh, that that first sale applies to copies uh, lawfully made overseas but sold with authorization in the United States. Um, you know, that a different theory for how you get there and not interpreting uh, the Section 109A, but but relying on the common law uh, of of the first sale doctrine, but. Um, uh, the fact that they also affirm, you know, they also argued for that result. Uh, I think that, that that it's very likely that the Supreme Court, uh, e either in its holding or, or perhaps just in dicta, because they really don't need to get there for the, under the facts of this case, because this case doesn't involve copies that are lawfully sold with the authorization of the rights holder in the United States. Um, but, but. Uh, um, I, I think it's highly likely that that the decision, you know, again, at least in dicta, if not in the holding, that they will uh, indicate that 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 uh, uh, the first sale doctrine does apply uh, to copies uh, sold with authorization in the United States. That certainly seems like the reasonable, you know, if you could rewrite everything in the law to make it actually make sense to do what it seems like Congress meant to do. It seems like they wanted to let U.S. manufacturers uh, or rights holders take advantage of foreign markets and sell things cheaper out there without having to worry that, that, they'll, that people will do what Kurt Sang did. But they don't want this obviously absurd consequence that we now are facing from the Second Circuit decision. So, Carrie, I want to ask you. So, 
you you outlined a pretty nasty worst case scenario, and we've heard now maybe what what, what Jonathan thinks is most likely to come out. In any event, when this case when this decision comes out, what kind of next steps do you think the library community and maybe some of the related communities that we work with and for? Um, what are the next steps that folks are going to have to take once this decision comes out and think about taking? Well, I think that um, I think that uh, first of all, we would want to make, have librarians really understand what the ruling means and educate themselves. Um, if the ruling goes bad, um, I would anticipate that grassroots efforts by librarians across the country would be very effective um, in terms of a change in legislation. Um, uh, I think that also um, the strength of lending, just the notion of it, is just not going to go away in, in our country. So um, I think that you can continue to have your garage sales. You can, can continue to sell your car to the dealership. Um, and you can c continue to lend books to people in your community. Listen, did someone else want to weigh in? I heard an intro a drawing in of breath. I think that was my breath. And I actually wanted to ask Jonathan a question, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, Jonathan, you outlined a, a set of exceptions, and the Solicitor General has, has outlined that set of exceptions, apparently, that would pretty much cover the ground for library lending. But I want to get to what Carrie just said. None of those exceptions, it seems to me, would authorize our students, for those of us who are in universities, to resell their textbooks, would they? I mean, it seems to me that this would still basically allow publishers to close down the secondary textbook market, which I think has always been desirable from their point of view. And would it, wouldn't it still give me a problem with reselling my Toyota? Uh, would not it be possible for uh, Toyota to say to me, when you resell that Toyota, you have to give us 10% of the sale or whatever it is, or we won't let you do that? Well, I, I think, uh, I again, what, a lot depends on what the court says, meaning if the court says, comes up with a compromise position, uh, sold with authorization in the United States, then that okay. probably would take care of the, the, the graduate student because, or the student because he would be buying the textbook new in the United States. Most of them. Uh, right. And, and, and it, you know, if you, especially if you bought your car from a Toyota dealer, it would take care of, of, okay. of that too. However, you know, it, it, let's, say, let's say, you know, we go to the worst case scenario, which is entirely possible. Um, uh, uh, where, where they simply say, nope, it's got to be lawfully made, only manufactured in the United States, doesn't apply uh, to any foreign copies uh, whatsoever. Uh, in that situation, um, I, I would say, at least with respect to the student reselling the book, um, maybe there, you would have a fair use argument, um, you know, but, but that uh, you, you'd have to, you know, that would that would be uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, of a burden for the student to have to, the student on his own to have to raise a fair use defense for 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 the resale. With respect to your Toyota, you actually have a different argument, which is copyright misuse. Um, and, and actually, in the Costco versus Omega case that Brandon talked about at the outset, when the case went back on remand to the district court. The district court found that Omega was misusing its copyright uh, because it, it basically said, look, this is not a copy. The watch is not a copyrighted product. Uh, just the logo on the watch is copyrighted, and it's trying to restrict the sale of the watch by virtue of its control of the copyright. So it's sort of leveraging its control over the copyright over the entire product. And the, and the court there said that was a misuse. So I would, uh, you know, so, so, so I could see you trying to make that argument with respect to Toyota that uh, it would be a misuse for them to control, to try to control the resale of the entire car by virtue of the software. Uh, now, a flip side is to say, well, they could say, look, the software is much more important to the operation of the car than the logo of the watch was to the operation of the watch, uh, and it would probably be less of a problem for you doing your own resale as opposed to, let's say, a CarMax, meaning if I were Toyota, I would go after CarMax, not Kevin Smith. 
Um, but but so, so, I'm so, relieved. So, yeah. So 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 the point is is that I think there are theories out there, but it would make the it would be a lot harder. To, to Ray, it would be much a much, much messier situation, and that's why I think regardless of what the Supreme Court does, there's a very good chance that this is going to be kicked over to Congress next year. I think that's highly likely. I mean, one thing, so I, I mentioned, you know, we were talking about a best-case scenario earlier, and one thing I would just ask folks to think about is, I mean, in some sense, Libraries are like the low-hanging fruit, right? The chart that Jonathan showed you gives gives everyone involved, especially the Supreme Court, you know, an easy way to kind of say, okay, well, whatever else happens, libraries are fine because they are the special children of the Copyright Act. Um, but I don't see this case. This is I get to just take moderator's prerogative. I don't see this case um, satisfying everyone else in the world. You know, your garage sailors and so on. Um, they're still going to be left on the hook, even if libraries get better off. So let's now move to the questions. Um, we've had just a few here, and uh, and I think they all are, are uh, quite interesting. So let me start with a question from Dan Lee at uh, Carrie's Old Stomping Grounds in Arizona. Uh, Dan asks, you know, libraries library issues aren't literally, you know, being raised in the case. You know, Kurt saying is not a library. Are we really confident that the court is going to address them? And I, maybe I'll ask uh, Jonathan, you know, we've seen libraries addressed in all these briefs. Maybe I'll flip it around. Can the court dodge the library question at this point? For me? Sorry, for Jonathan. Can, okay. the, court, can the court dodge this library question? And then, Carrie, you can jump in, too. Jonathan? Okay. okay, we've lost Jonathan, and Jonathan's on mute. Carrie, do you want to take a swing at it? I don't. I don't see how they could ignore it. I mean, it's everybody's been mentioning it, mentioning it, and even you know uh, other civil society people, groups that don't even you know aren't associated with libraries have been talking about this. It would be um, really detrimental to um, advancing learning, and it would be. I don't know how you'd even manage it. Uh, trying to put it, uh, trying to implement something like that. So I don't think they're going to ignore us. I think they're going to take care of us. Yeah, and I, and I agree. Um, all of the briefs, as Jonathan has said, Jonathan's own brief was wonderful, and the brief from Wiley and from the Solicitor General have put this issue pretty squarely in front of the court. I think it would be kind of embarrassing to the court to try and, and duck it now. I think I, I would agree with all of you on that. And then, Kevin, I wanted to ask you a question. So you mentioned you, you have a kind of a theory of why this whole problem exists, which is that we, we joined the international regime of copyright protection uh, under the Berne Convention, um, but there are these weird artifacts that still exist in our law. And Kyle Courtney asks, you know, if international, international law kind of gets a short shrift in the Supreme Court, at least with some of the justices out there, do you think that the justices would be sympathetic to this um, idea of looking at our international agreements? Is there a distinction here between agreements and international law that would, would make a difference? I, I think there probably is. I think that international IP protection has uh, a, a sort of better odor. Uh, it certainly has in the last few administrations than um, other kinds of international law, and even the the administrations that have looked with askance looked askance at international law have been very encouraging of international agreements uh, of of uh, ratcheting up i p protection patent and copyright protection. Uh, internationally. So I, I think this is an area where the court is more likely to look at the policies behind our agreement, with our, our acceptance of the Berne Agreement and the, uh, the TRIPS Agreement, which is part of the World Trade Organization's general agreement on tax and tariff. And, and I guess that gets at the reason. I think the court would look more favorably on these international agreements because they're trade agreements. We're not looking at other countries and saying, well, they don't have a death penalty, so therefore the United States should have not have a death penalty. That argument has never 
have any weight with U.S. courts or very little weight with U.S. courts. But I think looking at these and recognizing that they are trade agreements and this is a trade issue makes um, them more likely to give some account to the international agreements. But that's just the theory. Uh, this is Jonathan Band. I'm back, and I'm sorry that I uh, that I that I got disconnected myself, so I missed the opportunity to answer that earlier question. Uh, but if I may, uh, I, 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 this goes back to you know how likely is it that library issues would be addressed at all, uh, given that this case doesn't involve libraries. And and uh, again, until a few weeks ago, I would have agreed with that. Um, uh, again, you know, as you say, the facts really didn't address libraries. The facts of the case didn't address libraries, and we were sort of just uh, trying to inject ourselves uh, uh, in hopes of someone maybe mentioning uh, the, the concern of libraries and saying something nice about libraries, and you know, you know, and saying nice about the theories that we were articulating, but then. Uh, again, Wiley specifically referenced our theory um, for this sort of middle of the road compromise position, and then the Solicitor General, uh, in a footnote, addressed our theories. So, and, and our alternative theories. So, I, I think that that again significantly increases the likelihood of the court uh, addressing, uh, or, or at least, a, you know, again, maybe in a footnote, maybe, maybe in a concurring opinion, maybe in dicta. But I, you know, the fact that the the respondent and then the solicitor general addressed our concerns, and I think that that, you know, maybe just again reflects the notion that, uh, you know, maybe you know people out there really, really do love us, uh, and uh, and and they realize that these arguments that we were raising about the potential adverse impact were could be pretty troubling to the court, and so that they needed to find a way out uh, uh, for libraries. We're definitely feeling the love after last week's hot tea trust decision anyway. Um, <laughs> and I, now I want to ask a question of Carrie. Um, I think uh, so. Nancy Baker from Iowa has asked a question that I think also can lead to uh, several uh, issues, which is, you know, could this case have implications for a library's ability to sell unwanted gift books? And I think relatedly, you could just simply ask, you know, libraries get lots of stuff from lots of different places, and they manage their collections in all sorts of ways. Are there implications here beyond lending? Oh, yeah, absolutely there are. Um, uh, and again, lots of times you get gifts and you don't know the background story of where they came from. And, uh, uh, but if you did include them in the library sale, you'd, you'd have some trouble. Um, also, earlier, uh, Kevin mentioned museums. I mean, you, I know, I remember uh, at the library we used to get a lot of images, you know, a, you know, a lot of pictures, photographs. Can we put them on the wall or not? That would be the uh, question in terms of this issue. And the yeah, museum associations have filed a brief, haven't they? Yes, the museum association and, and about 30 individual museums, because, again, that phrase lawfully met into this title appears in Section 109C. And then if I just may add, in uh, Section 1101, that's the exception that allows uh, uh, a, 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 allows the, the performance or display in a classroom. So let's say that's what allows the showing of a, of, a, of, a, of a film in a classroom. That phrase, lawfully made under this title, appears there too. Right. And so if this if this means a lawfully made under this title means lawfully made in the United States that means that exception would not allow a a a high school teacher or a college teacher to show a foreign film in the classroom now again you would have to say that would be a fair use you would have a fallback but the very clear exception of 1101 all of a sudden would not appear would not apply to all of these foreign made films uh, which presumably, you know, we want to be able to show in our uh, in our classrooms. Well, that depends on the film. <laughs> so we're getting uh, we've got just one minute left, and so I just wanted to see if there's a last uh, one-liner or, or summary that anybody wants to put in the, into the pot before we before we end the session. Okay. There were a couple of questions that we didn't get to, but I, and I apologize for that. But I think it's been a fantastic discussion okay. today. I want to thank uh, all of our speakers. 
uh, Jonathan Band, Kevin Smith, Kerry Russell uh, for joining us today, and to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, there's going to be an archive of this presentation that all of you can access to so all of these slides, including that um, fantastic diagram that Jonathan had, uh, will be available on our website within a couple of days. Uh, so uh, just keep checking back at ARL.org, and uh, you should see it pop up there. And, uh, you know, obviously, like everything ARL does, it's all free for you guys to use and share with one another and talk about. So uh, thank, it, thank everyone uh, for joining us, and I hope uh, you'll stay tuned as we follow this exciting saga that I think is probably going to be with us for a few more months no matter what happens. Thanks a lot.